morning and a very warm welcome to everyone here today and to those joining us online. On Tuesday, the Guild meets at half past two. Also on Tuesday, the Bible studies and prayer meeting will be held in the church hall at seven o'clock. Wednesday, the Tanata is at two o'clock as usual. Friday, the social group committee meeting is at 7.30 in the hall. Next Sunday, the 4th of June, we are celebrating communion. There are still places available for the important trustee safeguarding training in Port William on Sunday the 4th of June at 2 o'clock. Please ask Malcolm if interested. And a week on Tuesday, our annual general meeting will be held in the church hall at 7 o'clock. All are very welcome. Thank you. So I hope that you will be able to hear me when I get the microphone back on. If there are any problems with, with the microphone, please somebody give me a wave and let me know um, because it's important that we hear everything that's happening. The microphone, I'm not wearing it just now until I get this sorted. Um, but obviously we want to do things right. So first off, let's just double check. <laughs> Is that all right? Yes. Is that all right? Yes. Even at the back? Yes. Okay. Folks online? Yep, they can hear as well. That's really important. We come before the Lord and we come before him with grateful hearts on this wonderful day, the day of Pentecost. Let all the earth acclaim God. Sing to the glory of his name. Come and see what God has done. Let the sound of his praise be heard. Blessed is God, who has not withdrawn from us his love and care. Let us worship God by singing together our first hymn, number 691. This is the day, 691. And we stand to sing, please.
And grant us a fresh knowledge of God's strength. Come, Holy Spirit, come again. And like a cleansing fire, refresh us and renew us. Come, Holy Spirit, come again. That we may celebrate God's love and praise God's glory with joyful worship. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Redeeming God, we pray to be free of the sin which burdens us, and so we call to you for forgiveness. For you have promised that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. As we remember our failings and wrongs, May the wind of your spirit refresh our souls and may your forgiveness flow through us like a refiner's fire. Lord Jesus Christ, you had promised your disciples that you would not leave them and at Pentecost they sensed anew your presence and grace. May the wind and flames of Pentecost help us to know you again, disturb our complacency, awaken our sense of responsibility, and rekindle our imaginations. Give us confidence to redress the balance of our greed and selfishness, and that us channels for your transforming love. May we see your spirit at work in the church, bringing gifts to all parts of the body of Christ, that we will have vision, that we will dream dreams. May we see your spirit at work in the world, renewing creation, bringing justice to all, bringing food to the hungry, water for the thirsty, rest to the weary and hope for all. We bless you and praise you. Hear us now as we all pray together as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Something to think about. Have you ever found yourself moping around and wondering just exactly what to do with yourself. I think during the times of the pandemic there were many days when we were scratching our heads and saying, what shall we do next? But yes, there are days when you really can't settle into anything. Nothing excites you enough to put in an effort of getting started. Sometimes that happens towards the end of a holiday too. Or sometimes it's a Saturday or a Sunday and we just think that nothing catches our attention. 
This was how it was for the followers of Jesus immediately after he finally left them. They stuck together as a group, meeting together frequently. They'd done a lot of praying. They'd recognised the death of Judas had left them short of a team member, so they'd drawn lots and chose Matthias to make the numbers up to twelve again. And they gathered together as a group, and they prayed a bit more. But perhaps there are, they, perhaps they were not really knowing what to expect. But then one day, the unexpected did happen, and it shook them from their apathy, and it brought them courage for their prayers. For first, there was a terrific noise, like a tornado, but it was inside the room where they were gathered. Then there were what looked like flames, flames moving for round the room and flickering above the heads of each person. Finally, everyone began to speak out loud, but not in Aramaic, their native language. They were sp- talking in Greek, in Latin, in Arabian, and in other Middle Eastern and Asian languages. They were speaking words of worship to God in the dialects of every person present in Jerusalem that day, and none of them had ever been taught these languages. Christians understand that this was the Holy Spirit coming in a special way into the lives of the members of the first church. Jews and Christians believe the Spirit is a driving force that encourages us to explore and learn in every aspect of life. The Spirit is our source of inspiration. Christians believe that God shows himself to us in three ways. God the Father and Creator, Jesus who is God in human form, and finally the Holy Spirit, the power of God active in the life of every human being. What came as a shock to the early church was in fact that the Holy Spirit was so utterly unpredictable. A deafening noise, a fire that didn't burn, and an impulsion to speak out in words that they had never been taught. They were overwhelmed by the experience. They defied all their expectations. It didn't conform to anything they'd ever met before. This experience was a driving force that resulted in the creation of Christianity. So let's celebrate today the festival of Pentecost and rejoice in the message of the coming of the Holy Spirit to us. Let us pray. Spirit of truth, whom the world can never grasp, Touch our hearts with the shock of your coming, the love of your coming, the hope of your coming to us. Fill us with desire for your disturbing peace and fire us with longing to share your uncontainable word. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our second hymn for today is number 857 in Mission Praise. It's I, the Lord of Sea and Sky. Hymn 857, and we stand to sing, please.
Psalm 104, reading from verse 24. Lord, you have made so many things. How wisely you made them all. The earth is filled with your creatures. There is the ocean, large and wide, where countless creatures live, large and small alike. The ships sail on it, and in it plays the diaphragm, that sea monster which you made. All of them depend on you to give them food when they need it. You give it to them and they eat it. You provide food and they are satisfied. When you turn away, they are afraid. When you take away their breath, they die and go back to the dust from which they came. But when you give them breath, they are created. You give new life to the earth. May the glory of the Lord last forever. May the Lord be happy with what he has made. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they pour out the smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. As long as I live, I will sing praises to my God. May he be pleased with my song, for my gladness comes from him. Praise the Lord, my soul. Praise the Lord. And our second reading is from Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, reading verse 1, page 149 in the Pew Bibles. When the day of Pentecost came, all the believers were gathered together in one place. Suddenly there was a noise from the sky, which sounded like a strong wind blowing, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire, which spread out and touched each person there. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to talk in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were Jews living in Jerusalem, religious people who had come from every country in the world. When they heard this noise, a large crowd gathered. They were all excited because each one of them heard the believers speak in his or her own language. In amazement and wonder, they exclaimed, these people who are talking like this are Galileans. How is it then that all of us hear them speak in our own native languages? We are from Parthia, Media and Elam, from Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, from Pontus and Asia, from Perth, from Prigia and Pamphylia, from Egypt and the regions of Libya, near Cyrene. Some of us are from Rome, both Jews and Gentiles converted to Judaism, and some of us are from Crete and Arabia, yet all of us hear them speaking in our own languages about the great things that God has done. Amazed and confused, they kept asking each other, what does this mean? But others made fun of the believers, saying, these people are drunk. Then Peter stood up with the other eleven apostles, and in a loud voice began to speak to the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, listen to me, and let me tell you what this means. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only nine o'clock in the morning. Instead, this is what the prophet Joel spoke about. This is what I will do in the last days, God says. I will pour out my spirit on everyone. Your sons and daughters will proclaim my message. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will have dreams. Yes, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will proclaim my message. I will perform miracles in the sky above and wonders in the earth below. There will be blood, fire, and thick smoke. The sun will be darkened, and the moon will turn red as blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. And then, whoever calls out to the Lord for help will be saved. Amen. May God have his blessing to these students. We sing once more, and the hymn is number 612, Spirit of the Living God. Six, one, two, stand to sing, please.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of your presence, open the mind of God to us, that in your light we may see light, and in your strength be strong. Amen. Annie Johnson Flint wrote these words. Some of us stay at the cross, some of us wait at the tomb, quickened and raised with Christ, yet lingering still in the gloom. Some of us bide at the Passover feast with Pentecost all unknown, the triumphs of grace in the heavenly place that our Lord has made his own. If the Christ who died had stopped at the cross, his work had been incomplete. If the Christ who was buried had stayed in the tomb, he had only known defeat. But the way of the cross never stops at the cross. And the way of the tomb leads on to the victorious grace in the heavenly place where the risen Lord has gone. The Holy Spirit's work began at Pentecost. It moved on people and it moved lives. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. Acts 4, verse 33. When I've had a bad day, and we all have days that we would sometimes rather forget, I often motivate myself with a phrase. You might even have heard me say it as I go through life. The phrase is this. Oh well. Onwards and upwards. Oh, onwards and upwards. If said some, to someone else, the phrase means effectively something like, I hope you go on to achieve greater things and be more successful. It's a lovely thing to say, and it offers real encouragement. Onwards and upward sets a positive direction, one that relies on a style of optimism. I believe the phrase to have first been used by the Christian writer C.S. Lewis, who declared onwards and upwards to Narnia and the North. When you stop and consider the work of the Holy Spirit, and that's what Pentecost is all about, there are three direct dimensions or directions. Firstly, the Holy Spirit does an inward work in us. He is the one who administers justification, regeneration and the new birth in our lives. He is the one who cleanses us within, who comforts us and bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. <coughs> Secondly, the Holy Spirit does an upward work in us. Jesus says in John 16 of the Holy Spirit, He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit is ever pointing us heavenward to glorify Jesus and the Father. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit does an outward work in us. The empowerment that took that placed on that day of Pentecost, resulted in a powerful gospel witness and 3,000 people from a variety of backgrounds were radically saved. The church goes ever onward by God's grace and leadership. 
So we remember God's faithful action in the past, which is a good thing, so long as it prompts us to seek God's action amongst us in the present and to prepare for God's action through us in the future. All too often, when we look back to commemorate God's actions in the past, our attention lingers there, and we grow nostalgic for the days gone by and compare unfavourably with those that we currently live in. And here's where the danger lies, as there is nothing more resistant to purposeful, hopeful action in the present than nostalgia, the sentimental longing for a bygone era. Few times are as ripe for nostalgia as Pentecost. After all, weren't these the glory days of the church? Spirit-filled preaching, attentive, even miraculous listening, and 3,000 people converted in a single day. And what have we seen or done since that could possibly compare? But God's ongoing work to love and bless and redeem the world right now, right here, through us, is a reality. A reality still for our times, and even as God reaches to the inwardly fearful and to those who are afraid to turn their eyes upwards to him. His touch, his healing, and his Holy Spirit's movement can bring a whole new way of life. Consider how the time of Pentecost brought freedom. The disciples' initial experiences of the resurrected Christ were behind closed doors. In their fear, they huddled in the upper room. Were they to remain there, contained and confined, timid and silent? No. No. They moved out to the streets of Jerusalem, upwards and onwards to the authorities of that time. It may have appeared as a form of madness had those folks had too much to drink. But inspired and ecstatic utterances were touched with the men's courage and the Holy Spirit's power. Onwards and upwards, Jesus' apostles were eyewitnesses of his ministry. With their ears they had heard his words, with their hands they had touched him, with their own eyes they had held, beheld his sacrificial death on the cross, seen the empty tomb, and witnessed his living presence after his resurrection. They were eyewitnesses to the great repent, redemptive acts of God in Jesus Christ. They took all this in and allowed it to transform their thinking. Then with the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, they were to verbalise even more clearly all that they had seen and heard. Christ's witnesses were keen to bring glory to God, confident in his direction and his guidance. And also, with their lives, the apostles bore testimony to the presence of Jesus Christ within them. Acts 4.13 When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realised that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. They took note that these men had been with Jesus. The un mistakable transformation in their lives. This transformation which came from faith in the living Lord gave authenticity to the message from their lips. Had it not been for the evidence of the living Christ within them, their testimony would not have been acceptable and would not have produced the dramatic results that came about. As a result of their devotion and loyalty to Christ, this outward work became dramatically real. If 
our testimony today, in this world, in our world, is merely the testimony of a spectator who relates what God is doing in other people's lives, this will not have any great weight. We will not honour the great commission which has been given to us in Christ's name. And it may be wonderful to be able to relate our past conversion experience. That's if we talk about these things at all. However, we really need to keep our experience with the Lord current and the things we share with others relevant. It's not enough to live a good life and hold ourselves to hold ourselves the difference that Jesus Christ makes for us. Instead, we should communicate to those about us the great things that he does for us every single day. Although at times the apostles were critics of the status quo, the fundamental message was not that of giving voice to complaints or being caught up in an endless cycle of debate. God wants us to use our statements of what he is doing in our lives to assist others to have faith. And upwards and onwards should be part of that conversation. Many people think of the gospel as being good advice, when in reality it is so much more than that. It is the greatest of all things. It is the good news that propels us ever onwards. Let us go onwards and upwards to share the gospel. In her book, Church and Around, the writer Letty M. Russell explains, Salvation is a story and not an idea, a word that describes God's mending and reconciling action in our lives and the whole of creation as we respond in faith to God's saving action we are drawn into the story and God's gift of justice and love is revealed in our lives may we be true witnesses for Jesus Christ who share the good news of what God has done for us for we easily forget how blessed we really are. Yes, some of us who have been Christians for a long time may get caught up in nostalgia for times past. We often also forget what it's like to be held hostage by sin. We might even become complacent and even ungrateful. But then God sends a reminder in the form of a new believer or more than one new believer but someone who gives an exuberant testimony of what God has done in their life. And we see the joy that is theirs and the joy that is ours when we are free from the law of sin and death. Imagine that experience being multiplied more than 3,000 times. And remember... God can do this. It is the Holy Spirit who gives life and empowers believers to do what is right, inwardly and outwardly and upwardly. May we want that ambition, that hope, that enthusiasm and that fervour in our lives again and always. Onwards and upwards, my friends. Onwards and upwards. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the individual gifts and talents that you have given to each one of us for use for the greater good. We are all one body, and we all need each other. But most of all, we need you, Lord. We thank you for this new day. Another chance to seek to be more Christ-like in our ways. We thank you for your word. 
that reaches, uh, reaches us anew in our time and place, in a language that we understand. Lord, we pray today for all those who are unable to be here in person, whether through ill health or caring commitments to another. Be with them, Lord, and minister to them at this most difficult time. We pray for our village here, for our neighbours and our friends, for our new Scots and for those in our schools. We pray for all in our wider community. We pray for those who do not yet know of your redeeming love. Let us be a light in the dark, and that through our love in action, we might lead them to relationship with you. We pray for our leaders locally and nationally. Give them the gift of wisdom and of discernment for what is right. We know that those in positions of power can face all sorts of temptation and can be full of pride all too easily. Help them, Lord, to clearly see what is right and to advocate what is just, even when it is not the easy option. We pray for all those who are bereaved and for all those who are ill or awaiting hospital results or treatments. We pray for the medical teams attending to their needs. We think especially for those with mental health struggles, with addiction issues, and the relationships and families that are affected. Lord, our world is so broken. We are in so in need, so in need of your Holy Spirit to be in our lives. Pour out your Spirit on us. Pour it out on you, Lord, and grant that we may speak your universal language of repentance, of forgiveness, of acceptance, of love and salvation to all who will hear it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's turn to our hymn books, Mission Praise, number 560. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven.
The blessing of God be yours. The blessing of the beloved Son be yours. The blessing of the perfect Spirit be yours. The blessing of the three be poured out upon you, serenely and generously, today and forever. Amen. May we sing. May God's blessing.